It's a sport that provides multiple challenges for athletes and features skilled competitors with multiple talents. So it's no surprise that the popularity of triathlon is multiplying. We believe we're probably one of the largest growing display sports in the world. On this edition of Beyond the Medals, USA Triathlon CEO Rob Urbach gives us a report on the state of the sport and its exciting prospects for the future. We're creating a whole culture of triathlon on schools and campuses. Plus, how does a world-class triathlete do business? We'll find out from reigning world champion Gwen Jorgensen. You know, there's things that you just need on a daily basis to live, and thankfully I have support from sponsors to help me out so that I can live my dream job. It's all coming up on Beyond the Medals. Hello, I'm Rick Caro, and welcome to Beyond the Medals, the show that adds value to your understanding of sport with a focus on the business behind the games. This month, we'll examine the phenomenal success of triathlon. It's booming at every level and has a chance to take a significant stride forward as an NCAA emerging sport for women. On that note, I'll also talk with USOC Chief Scott Blackman about the importance of college athletics to the U.S. Olympic program and why he's so concerned about the current economics of the NCAA. But let's begin with a look at some very encouraging numbers. Since triathlon became an Olympic event in 2000, participation is steadily growing. In 2014, continued that trend. Individual membership in USA Triathlon rose to nearly half a million. Those members took part in over 4,000 sanctioned events and trained together in more than 1,000 registered clubs. Annual memberships have risen over 30% since 2009, a very strong sign that those who are sampling triathlon are staying with the sport. All of this activity also is very good for the bottom line, giving USA Triathlon more resources to support the elite national team and invest back to the overall growth of the sport. The man leading this effort is with us now, Rob Urbach, CEO of USA Triathlon. We're Rob, we're delighted to have you and thank you very much for being here. The triathlon numbers are absolutely exploding. The trends are pretty significant. What parts of the trends excite you the most? I think it's our general membership. We have roughly 550,000 folks that are USA Triathlon members and it's a lot of that social energy. They usually have drawn into the sport through somebody that inspired them. Could be a neighbor could be a family member, could be a coach. And they get into our sport and they see the benefits of a healthy lifestyle, their ability to cross train through all three sports. It's pretty intoxicating, you know, I kind of tell people, it's almost like, remember your first concert, that emotion that you gained, whether it was the Rolling Stones or U2, you remember that powerful emotion. It's very similar with triathlon. We believe we're probably one of the largest growing display sports in the world. I think, you know, the USA Triathlon, our mission is certainly developed Olympians, but also really to make everyone else feel like an Olympian. I think that's really the charging that growth. And you've done a really good job of, of understanding the psychology behind a membership program itself. What's the value proposition behind the membership program you've got, and why is that important for elite success? Well, the membership is certainly fuels our, our business. I mean, if we're doing our 500,000 plus members are providing all the funding and resources which we reinvest back into the sport, develop our athletes. And for members that get access to training, access to coaches, sponsor programs, the ability to race at discounts, the ability to be ranked, and there's an associated several benefits that really help them facilitate and reach their potential as triathletes. And of course, very important sponsorship, always critical. You have the endemics, and the endemics are very important, the clothing, the, 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 the medical, all of those aspects. But it's harder to break out into the category sponsors, the broader sponsors. You're doing it. How are you doing it, and what are the prospects for success of that? Sure. USA Triathlon has over 30 partners, and I think our ability to be successful in the non-endemic space with partners such as BP and and MetLife and Transamerica and several others is really leveraging the passion drivers of our sport. We had some pretty brand loyal folks. They believe, they identify themselves as triathletes, which we really tell our demic partners we can influence purchase intent, drive competitive advantages, distinguish between our competitors. And I think our folks are getting return on their investments in, their, in the sponsorship of triathletes. Do the sponsors understand that it's a value proposition as well to be associated with these athletes who are clearly the best in the world, they're not doing one thing well, they're doing three things well, and it, it's got to resonate with sponsors too. 
Sure, it's a little more challenge, and I think yeah. that's the brand of triathlon. It's a little more complicated. It's it's not an easy sport to be able to train, cross train, and on elite level, to be world class at all three sports. The speeds that they're swimming, biking, and running approaches the best in the world. And I think that higher end, that leading edge, it's it's a combination of amazing feats of athleticism, hard work, leveraging training technologies, and the positive attributes of the brand are very leverageable. On your watch, the innovation has been really important, creativity, evolution of the brand, got the Super Sprint event. Uh, is that an important way to bring in new fans to, to, the, to the sport itself and, and, and drive the demographics? Absolutely, Rick. We've mm -hmm. largely been a participatory sport over the years. The spectators are you know, harder to come by due to the length of the course and you know cycling for 25 miles. But the Super Sprint is fast and furious racing. We did a race broadcast on Universal in Las Vegas on this trip. Lap style racing, draft legal, portable pool, swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run twice through. So coming off that last run at a four minute mile pace, grabbing some goggles, running up a ramp, diving in a pool, it's compelling television. So for the casual fan out there that's never maybe seen a triathlon, they see this, and wow, this is chaotic, high intense racing. There's sprint finishes, shoulder to shoulder bike riding, technical courses, it's pretty exciting to see. We have a lot more triathlon talk coming up on Beyond the Medals. Later in the program, we'll catch up with reigning world champion Gwen Jorgensen. And up next, a golden opportunity for the entire sport as triathlon bids for NCAA championship status. Rob Urbach comes back to tell us how it can happen and what it will mean as Beyond the Medals continues. For the first time since the ITU World Triathlon Series began in 2009, the grand final to crown the series champion will be held in the United States. Chicago will play host to 150 elite triathletes and over 8,000 total competitors for the event in mid-September with live coverage on Universal Sports. Back with Rob Burback, CEO of USA Triathlon. So the ITU event that you're having, it's a partnership, Lager Darren Limited and, and the, uh, your association, held in Chicago, huge event. How important is that event to you and the industry? It's really the biggest triathlon since the 2012 Olympics. We've got 8,000 athletes from 120 countries. There's 10 races over four days past all the iconic landmarks in Chicago. It's going to make really good television. Our partners, the Legged Air, we're broadcasting all the World Triathlon Series races around the world. And we think this one is by far the biggest race. There are Olympic qualification spots on the line, the world champions of the year. Hopefully, Gwen Jorgensen and our women will be vying for those big titles. And we're very excited to bring that to the U.S. Well, as you said, it crowns the 2015 or is involving the 2015 um, uh, in, uh, national and international champion, but it also has profound Olympic implications as well for qualification. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. So if a U.S. athlete finishes in the top eight, there's a little bit of automatic qualification for the Olympics, depending upon what happens in a prior event, which is a test event in Rio. We fully anticipate not just the U.S., but other countries will using that race as their prime Olympic qualifiers. The most competitive triathlon in the world is the grand final. And within a year, you're going to have the grand final on U.S. soil and hopefully some Olympians bringing back some medals. How important is that to the sport? It's really significant. The amount of exposure that we get, the amount of more media drives our sponsorship, drives our membership, and really drives our business dramatically. Just when triathlon became adopted to the Olympics in 2000 was a big driver for the sport. Medals will certainly geometrically increase our awareness. And, and, and it's, uh, for you, it's all about expanding the business, expanding demographics, expanding sponsorship. And the NCAA handed you another opportunity as well by uh, defining a women's triathlon as an emerging sport as well. How important is that? It's really a watershed moment for USA Triathlon. In four or five years, we worked to try to get the NCAA to adopt triathlon as an emerging sport. And last year, all three divisions voted each over 90% percentage to include triathlon it was called the emerging sport program so we now have 10 years to have 40 schools running a full varsity program we plan to do that by 2020 
in order to do that, we put a grant program together. Uh, roughly $2.6 million were available to NCAA schools to start programs. That money goes towards coaches, goes towards scholarship, et cetera. And it's very, very meaningful. Women before coming out of college, coming out of high school triathletes had no opportunities. So they either had to either be a runner or a swimmer or do something else. And now we continue their triathlon career, and it's going to be really important to develop those athletes for future Olympians. And you and your staff and your board made an important policy decision to support this program through the NCAA to develop women's triathlon in an aggressive manner. Uh, I assume that is a very important priority for you. You said by 2020, but it's a very important uh, priority for you in your daily operation. No, absolutely. We're, cr we're creating a whole culture among the NCAA institution of triathlon on schools and campuses. I don't know of any other, you know, governing sport governing body that put these type of level of grant together. So we're investing pretty significantly because we believe this is ultimately be a driver. Then once the women become a full varsity sport, we plan to add the men shortly thereafter. Well, the first uh, round of grants were awarded to eight schools, two in Division I, uh, ASU and, and East Tennessee State, uh, four in Division II, and, and two in Division Three. Uh, do you need more support and more participation from those big five power conferences to succeed? You know, we don't initially because the sweet spot might be even a Division II that it's a big factor for those institutions. The dynamic with the Power Five conferences, learning more autonomy and various litigation, it's a little challenging environment, but we're in conversations with four or five other household names in Division I that we believe will be coming forward with grants shortly. If I heard, uh, and I took a meeting with an athletic director, and he heard the words non-revenue sport, that might be the end of the meeting for a while. How do you sell it to athletic director? Great question. <laughs> We're one of the few sports that can actually self-liquidate, Rick. Yeah. You run a community event on your campus and you can self-liquidate the investment for your program. Triathlete gives you access to a high demographic, to a powerful alumni group that are triathletes. And they'll come, we believe, and support those schools. We've given them essentially triathlon in a box program to help them liquidate their entire investment for their NCAA program. Rob, thank you very much for joining us. Best of luck for you and for USA Triathlon. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. Pleasure being here. Coming up, we'll stay on the subject of college sports. Scott Blackman has strong opinions about how the USOC and the NCAA should be working together. And he'll share them when we return. And let's check your knowledge of sports beyond the medals. Triathlon has been approved as an NCAA emerging sport. But can you name the five NCAA women's sports that once were emerging sports and have become championship sports? We'll give you the answer a little later in the program. Stay with us. Time now to get back to the business of Olympic sport. Time to welcome back Scott Blackman, CEO of the U.S. Olympic Committee. Scott, the financial model of college sports rapidly changing, but there is a significant upheaval. Non-revenue producing sports are in jeopardy. Others are not. How do you assess this situation? It's, uh, it's very concerning to us. Um, if you look at our success at the Olympic Games, a lot of it is attributable to the great sport programs maintained at our colleges and, and universities. 65% of our Olympic team in London was comprised of college athletes, either current or former college athletes. And we have seen over the last 10 to 20 years a reduction in the number of Olympic sport programs in colleges. I think 75% of the men's gymnastics programs have been uh, eliminated. I think 50% of the men's wrestling programs have been eliminated. Over 50 swimming programs have been eliminated. And this, this isn't all men's programs. There's some women's programs too. I mean, Title IX, you know, more than any other reason is the reason that we're at the top of the medal table because our women got such a great head start in competition. But this is an issue that's affecting women's sports um, and men's sports. And the, the concern to me is that we're reducing our belief in the power of sport to make the world a better place. So PE programs are disappearing in middle schools. They're disappearing in high schools. And our, our recognition that sport plays a role in the overall balanced human being is, is an issue. So we have to work hard 
to convince the college administrators, to convince the conferences that these, these programs are important. And, and the good news is that the conference commissioners that we've spoken with, many of, many of the athletic directors, many of the college presidents agree that the challenge is this. With full cost of attendance and meals, we, we've just added $4 million, $5 million to the budget of every athletic director in the country who has this issue. And we haven't given them any sources of revenue to offset that. So this is something we need to wrestle with very quickly or else we will see a further erosion in the number of those college sport programs. It's hard politically to harmonize, but you have the ability to do things that other people may not have been able to do before. You've got the national programs, you've got the NGBs, you've got in some sports where uh, you're, the NGBs will act as the sport uh, the funnel and conduit, in other cases the college programs will. Is there a way to standardize, harmonize, coordinate? It begins with communication, and the good news is we're increasing the level of communication that exists among the, the U.S. Olympic family, namely our NGBs and the USOC, and the college sports system. You know, I used to think our system, Olympic sport, was complicated, but if you look at college institutions and the NCAA and the coaches associations and the athletic directors, there are so many different constituents, each of which has an important point of view that, that, that I think that the college sports system probably is more complicated than, than we are, and that's saying a lot. Yeah, that's saying a lot, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully both you and, and uh, uh, Dr. Embert can work on some kind of a structure to be able to work together on that. Have you, ha have you guys uh, communicated? We have. We've met, and we have strong support uh, from the NCAA, from not only Dr. Embert, but Mark Lewis, mm -hmm. uh, Oliver Luck. You know, they, they share the same beliefs that we do on this, and we gathered uh, some athletic directors and some of the people from the NCAA and just had a brainstorm session. We had coaches there. We had NGBs there. There's, there's a recognition that we all have the same end here, which is to preserve, you know, the role of the student experience on campus. Coming up, we'll catch up with reigning world champion Gwen Jorgensen. How is she building her business and her brand while she's working toward Golden Rio as Beyond the Medals continues. Here's the answer to our knowledge check question. Triathlon is bidding to become the sixth women's NCAA sport to go from emerging to championship status. The previous five are rowing, ice hockey, water polo, bowling, and most recently, sand volleyball, which will become a full-fledged NCAA championship sport in 2016. It's fair to say that professional triathlon has passed the emerging stage, and this year, athletes in the ITU World Triathlon Series are competing for almost $3 million in prize money and bonuses. Through the end of May, six of this year's 10 events are in the books. On the women's side, they've all been won by defending series champion Gwen Jorgensen of the United States. In fact, Gwen has won 10 consecutive World Triathlons going back to 2014. And she's kind enough to join us by Skype from Spain, where she's training for July's triathlon in Hamburg. Hey, Gwen, you may be the most dominant athlete in any sport right now, winning 10 straight against the best in the world. Can you point to a reason? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a tough question, I guess. You know, I surround myself with who I think is the best, you know, my, the best coach. I believe my husband's the best support staff that I have. My sponsors, USAT. Everyone really supports me through it all. And, um, you know, I think that because I have such a great support network, that really helps me. And the sport of triathlon is constantly changing. And the athletes are always on the race line trying to win every single one of my competitors. And when I race up, I have to be ready for anything that they throw at me. And every race is a challenge. And it's probably one of the most dominant athletes in the world, is clear. But not all of our viewers may realize You've got a CPA license. You worked as an accountant before becoming a full-time triathlete. So give us an insight into the financial side of the sport. How much does it cost to train, travel, and compete? And where do you get funding outside of prize money from events? Yeah, um, because I have a background in accounting, I don't know if it's a good thing because I keep really good track of everything we uh, spend money on. And when we're in, I spend five months of the year in Australia and Things are more expensive in Australia. There's, you know, just the cost of living is more expensive. And 
we spent probably me and my husband spend $450 a week on food, which is just incredible, I think. So, you know, there's things that you just need on a daily basis to live. And thankfully, I have support from sponsors to help me out so that I can live my dream job. Yeah, so let's talk about those sponsors. You, you've got a you got a pretty strong portfolio of equipment partners right now. Are you getting a lot of attention from mainstream corporate sponsors as a result of your success? Yeah, it's been pretty great. Um, I have a sponsor or a agent, Heather, and she does a great job with all my sponsors. And I have some sponsors that are um, not endemic, so sponsors outside of the sport. And it's really great to see that because I think the sport is growing. Columbia Threadneedle is one of my personal sponsors, and they also sponsor the series, the World Triathlon Series, and it's just incredible that they provide that financial support. And also, when I was in London, I actually went and visited their office, and they encourage all of their employees to get involved as well. So I got to talk to a lot of their employees that did the age group race and did relay triathlon, and I think it's just really encouraging to see all those people get active and get into the sport. Um, another out of, uh, endemic sponsor that I have is actually Mark Halawesco, who sponsors me through his hotel boutique hotel in the Bahamas, the Island house. So, you know, it's really great to see, um, all these people coming into triathlon and supporting the triathlon world. Well, in September, you get to defend your world championship, the grand final in Chicago. It's your home turf. And that will probably be the biggest event you've seen. Is it the biggest event of your career? That's a good question. Um, you know, I guess I think that the London Olympics in 2012 were the biggest event um, of my career so far, but being able to race in Chicago will be really exciting. As you said, it's basically my hometown. It's about an hour away from where I grew up. So it's really exciting to be there. And I know that there's going to be a lot of supporters, a lot of fans, family, sponsors there. So that'll be exciting. Wynn Jorgensen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And best of luck this summer, and we'll see you in Chicago. Thank you. According to MVP Index, Wynn Jorgensen's success is carrying over to social media with a steady climb over the last six months. Her Instagram following has more than doubled since January, and she's added more than 1,000 new Facebook fans each month since April. That'll do it for this edition of Beyond the Medals, and you can learn more about triathlon by watching live coverage of the world's great events on Universal Sports Network including the ITU Grand Final from Chicago in September. Visit universalsports.com for schedules and program details. We'll be back next month to explore the business of swimming. U.S. gold medalist Missy Franklin joins me here in studio. You won't want to miss it. I'm Rick Haro. Thanks for watching Beyond the Medals. See you next time.